Be still and know that I am God, says our Lord of heaven and earth. On this beautiful Sunday morning, may we take a pause after the first week of school for many of us, after getting back to fall routines and lots of things on our agendas. May we take a deep breath. May we pause in this place and may we know that we are welcomed this day with God's great love and God's great grace. Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Bon Air Presbyterian Church. My name's Alex Krieger. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my joy and privilege to worship with you all this absolutely stunning, beautiful Sunday morning in August. Uh, we have had such a great week. Uh, I know we're going to get some more heat, but it's just been such a great week to enjoy the beauty of this great creation God has made for us. Um, some things going on in the life of our church we want to share. First is that um, immediately after worship today, anyone who is interested in helping out with children and youth and family ministry, there's going to be a brief training in the fellowship hall. There's also going to be, if you brought children and want to help, I believe, uh, child care or uh, no, they're going to be, we'll have a section set up for kids as well. We're going to be in the fellowship hall all the way. If you are interested in helping out, we have lots of opportunities, and we definitely could use some help for our Sunday morning classes. Um, and so we would love it if you would come and join us after that. If you have questions about when can help or what that looks like, Pastor Rebecca would love, love, love to talk with you more about that. Uh, and we definitely uh, your, your presence and ministry and help would be greatly appreciated. Uh, we also today have a special offering 
that will go to, um, there's two names on the back of it, that's my fault. The ministry is called Reconcile, in all caps, um, and it serves uh, the people of South Sudan. It's connected closely with the Presbyterian Church USA and our mission co-workers there, and I'll be sharing more of it in the message today. But um, if you are able to give and support this ministry that we invite for the special offering, you can do so in two ways. You can write a check and put it in the um, and, and put it in as the offering plate is passed and just write out to the church and put South Sudan in the memo line or you can mail it in later this week. You can also give, do what I'm going to do, which is give online. And that is a go to our website. There's a give page. And then there's some different boxes. One's general fund and one's special offering. Just click that special offering one. And then it gives some notes at the bottom and just write South Sudan in there. Um, this gift will go to, to really help peacemaking and care work in a place that very much needs that. Um, I also want to mention that this is our second to last Sunday for the summer that we will be doing 10 o'clock worship here in the sanctuary and woods worship out at 9 a.m. So next Sunday is our final worship in the woods for the summer and 10 a.m. sanctuary service starting September 8th. Um, the Sunday after Labor Day, we'll be having our rally day kickoff. We'll be back to 8.30 worship in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock worship uh, as well. And uh, that Sunday at 9.45, we'll have breakfast in the fellowship hall, and then we'll invite families um, to go visit their classrooms with Pastor Rebecca and the different teachers, and we'll invite uh, everyone to stay and hear about lots of different adult uh, CE opportunities for this fall. Uh, so we hope you will definitely mark your calendars for uh, September 8th. Finally, I want to mention that this Thursday, August 29th, is the uh, Richmond Mayoral Candidates Forum on Gun Violence happening at Second Baptist Church, hosted by Risk. Um, there's a sign-up in the Fellowship Hall. If you're able to join us, we would love to have you. We're going to carpool at 6 p.m. Um, if you si have a chance to sign up in the Fellowship Hall, great. If later this week you want to let us know you're coming, Please email both Brenda, but also um, as Brenda is going to be doing some, uh, some care for John this week, please uh, CC me as well, and I will make sure that you're signed up for that. With all of that said, I invite us at this time to stand and join together in our morning's call to worship. We are here to follow Jesus with halting steps and questioning minds, with ready hands and pierced hearts, with joy for each other and gratitude to God. Let us follow Jesus and let us worship God.
Trusting in the grace and mercy of our heavenly parent, let us confess our sins against God and one another using the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin, followed by a time of silent confession. Let us pray. O God, there are times when our greatest sin is not what we do, but what we fail to do. For those times when we have not spoken up, for those times when we have not acted, for those times when we have not responded, forgive us. Give us courage to name what is wrong when we see it. Give us confidence to do what is hard. Give us grace to reach out when what that is frightening or uncomfortable. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. New every morning is God's love for us, and so we are bold to proclaim the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This time, I would like to invite our children of the church to come forward for a time just for you. Good morning, friends. Good morning, good morning. So wonderful to see you all. Matching outfits, very nice. Oh my goodness. So did everybody survive the first week of school? Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. First week's pretty rough, isn't it? Yeah. So we just sang a song. Come on, get comfy, yeah. 
We just sang a song about being a, a channel of what? Does anybody hear for that song? What were we singing about? P -p peace. Being a channel of peace. Now, being a channel of peace, that seems like a really big thing to do. So being a channel of peace means to, wherever we go, we are representing God's peace. And in the business, what we like to say is being a non-anxious presence, which is very difficult to do. So it's just being mindful that when people see us, what they see is a represent representative of God and God's love and God's justice and God's peace. So I wanted to give you a tip. This is something that I really like to do when I need to be an instrument of God's peace. and I'm just not feeling super peaceful. I have what's called a hand labyrinth, okay? So this is, a labyrinth is kind of like a maze, but the difference between a labyrinth and a maze is that in a maze, you can go this way, or you can go this way, or you can go this way, or this way. In a labyrinth, there's one way in, and there's one way out. So what I like to do is I like to trace, yeah, it's kind of hard to see because it's kind of small, but I like to trace my finger, I'm so glad, or you can see it has pencil marks. Some, kids, some, of, some children I know have used a pencil on this, ma on this labyrinth, excuse me, and you just go in, and you get to the very center, and you know what you do when you get to the center? You go back out. And you can just do this, and it's very, it's helpful for me to contemplate. If you guys will pass that down so that everyone can see. And here's my trick. I have a coffee cup with a labyrinth on it. So I can trace my finger through this labyrinth when I'm drinking my morning coffee, or when I'm in a staff meeting, or when... <laughs> But you know, there are other labyrinths around the area. Um, I was just asking Pastor Alex if he knew where any labyrinths were, and he said, there might be one at the seminary. There are a couple of um, retreat centers around town. There's something called Richmond Hill. These places all have labyrinths, and you don't trace them. You can walk them. And I've walked several different labyrinths in my life. I got to walk a labyrinth at Massanetta over the summer. I've walked a labyrinth in St. Andrews, Scotland, which was pretty cool. So I encourage you to think about labyrinths as a way to be a channel, an instrument, a non-anxious presence of God's peace. And just carry that with you throughout your life as you grow up. And when you're feeling a little anxious or not very peaceful, I just encourage you to think about. And that goes for you big people, too. All right. So if you continue to pass around these labyrinths, you can hold that if you want. Look at it. Um, yeah, you can hold the mug. That's okay. Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God help, us be a channel help us be a channel of your peace. Help us find ways, Help us find ways. To, do to do that. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome to stay in here. You can go back to child care with Miss Kelly. Thank you. Did everybody get a chance to see? Let us pray for illumination before reading the scripture this morning. Loving God, fountain of every blessing, open us to your life-giving word and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that living water may flow through our hearts, a spring of hope for a thirsty world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first scripture this morning is, comes from Isaiah, and Isaiah is, was a prophet who 
in terms of what's in this, uh, his, in this book, was seven, between 750 to 700 years before the, the time of Jesus, a long time. And yet, there is something that is part of the, the story in Isaiah at the beginning. In chapter one, is, gives, gives us an understanding of why, what is the, the, sec, the second chapter, which is what we're gonna read today. In the first, in the first one, there was, Isaiah had a sense of God's presence and one of, and where, where God was getting not very happy about his people. And it comes together in the verses 16 and 17 in the first chapter. Where, where Isaiah says, wash, yourself, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. God wanted his people to be honest about their lives. And so after, after being indicted by not being faithful, then Isaiah goes to say that it's not the end of the earth, not the end of the world and not the end of your life. There's another, there's another way. And it comes in our, in our, in our first, in chapter two, from one, verses one through five. And it's all about the future, a way to live differently so that God can be pleased. So the, so our, so the, <clears throat> so the pa pa passage in starting at ch chapter 2 is, it says, The word that Isaiah's sons of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established, established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall steam to it. Many, many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of, of God. Thank be to God. Our second scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 76 through 79. This is originally uh, the, the song of Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, as he saw John uh, as he was about to be born with this great calling to be a person sharing a message of hope, of turning to God, of bringing light in moments of darkness, and of 
and of proclaiming a new path, a new way of peace. These words, though, are not meant just to be heard 2,000 years ago, but are words of encouragement and maybe invitation for all of us to seek as well that way of God's love, light, and peace. Let's listen again for the word of the Lord. You, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. You will tell his people how to be saved through the forgiveness of their sins. And because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk this day about two people I met now about 16 years ago. Their names are Shelvis and Nancy Smith Mather. I first met Nancy and Shelvis on the campus of Louisville Presbyterian Seminary. There's a group of about 35 of us gathering for a week of training right before we were going to go to different parts of the world to serve for a year. Myself and now my wife Hannah were both there as we were getting ready to go to Northern Ireland and serve for a year. And there were others who were going to be going to Peru, to, um, to uh, Guatemala, to India, and to Kenya. And included in that group for Kenya was uh, Shelvis and Nancy, that they were there to train. Now, most of us who were there, who were doing this year of service, were in our early 20s. And like pretty much all of us in our early 20s, or maybe all of us still today, we were a ball of really excited but also very anxious energy that whole week. We wanted to, to share our answers and our solutions to everything going on. So there was a lot of us talking over each other during that week. And I remember as we were there and full of anxious and excited to be there with others, I remember two people really stood out, and that was Nancy and Shelvis. As the rest of us were talking and full of anxiety, every time I looked at them, they were very calm and still and more ready to listen than to talk first. And during that week, as a lot of us were honestly kind of worried and afraid for what this year of service of being in a new land would be like, so many of us when we took the time to, to talk with either Nancy or Shelvis, each and every one of us came out of that feeling more at peace, more hopeful, more knowing that God's presence was with us in this great work. Now, I definitely remember Nancy and Shelvis from that time, and all of us could tell these were people who God was using for really great work. They spent that year serving in Kenya, um, getting to know different ministries and communities there, serving with them, sharing stories, uh, being incredible bridge workers for peace and faith. And after that year, they came back to the States for a little while, as we all did, and most of us went on to go to seminary or graduate school or different ministries and, and stay back in the United States. But for Nancy and Shelvis, something from their year in Kenya really stuck, really took hold of them. And a year later, they heard God calling them to do something pretty extraordinary, to become mission co-workers in this land that was going to become a country soon, but was still part of another country called South Sudan. Now, most of us who were paying attention to the news about 15 years ago remembers the stories of Darfur, remembers the stories of genocide in the western part of what is still Sudan today, a place Sadly, that's facing again horrific violence and horror. But what made less noise or news at that time was also what was happening to the people of South Sudan, people very similar to those in Darfur who were also being attacked and oppressed and, uh, and, the and knew great violence from Sudan, but also knew as well at the same time great eternal conflict and violence. A year after Shelvis and Nancy took the call to be mission co-workers there, South Sudan became their own nation, hoping that this would be a step for peace. I'm not sure what led these two great individuals to say, we want to serve there, but I think they knew that this was a community that's known for decades, if not centuries, 
war and violence, trauma and pain, has known deep divisions both from Sudan and internally, but also is full of people of great faith, of great love, of great hope for their country and their children and their children's children. And so they took that calling 14 years ago. During these 14 years they've been in South Sudan, they have seen a lot and a lot has happened for them. They welcome four children into the world um, who they are raising today and uh, both uh, <laughs> where they are and someone's coming back home with family. They have, uh, Shelvis has gone on to do doctoral work at Oxford University in peacemaking while they both are serving in South Sudan. And they've especially been involved with some key ministries there. One being Reconcile, which has been uh, started about a decade before they started there from churches of different backgrounds coming together and saying, we want a place that's gonna be a place of healing, of care, of people who know trauma and pain to be welcomed but also to train and serve community leaders and pastors and people who will come here and bring out with them uh, visions and values and plans and strategies for peacemaking in their community. Not us going in and changing the world, but us finding the people here in South Sudan who already have a heart for it and encouraging them and lifting up their gifts. That's been the, the majority of Shelvis and Nancy's work has been working with Reconcile and a couple other seminaries and areas of peacemaking and trauma healing and welcoming strangers. They've done this over the past 14 years with a lot of challenges. A few years after they started Reconcile Ministry, the town where it was, the military came in and kicked out about two-thirds of the people of that town, forcing Reconcile to move to another city, something that's pretty hard to imagine. Rebuild and renew and re-welcome people there. They've known over that time both continued violence within different tribes and, and nations. They've seen friends die, including through violence. And they've also known a really difficult time for all of us, especially them in another land during COVID and the pandemic, where Shelvis and Nancy, because of their work and what the, they were working on at the time, were actually separated for a very long time from themselves and their children in a time I can't imagine. And now for the last two years, they've now been responding to a new wave of attacks and violence and attempted genocide in Sudan and South Sudan as this militia has been coming through trying to rid Sudan and South Sudan of anyone who doesn't come from the same ethnicity and background and language and skin color as they are. It's been a really scary time. And I have to wonder what continues to give them strength, what continues to allow them to do this ministry in this strange land with lots of challenges. I think one is they see the strength in other people. They see God working through them. And even in the hardest of days, they know they are not alone. Uh, on their website, which shares lots of great stories, which I highly encourage you to check out, they share a story from last fall. They actually came back to the United States, to New York City, to meet with, along with other members of Reconcile Ministry in South Sudan, to meet with uh, delegates from the United Nations. And some of the members then went on to meet with even Security Council members of the United Nations. In that first conversation, they were asked a number of questions. One was, the United Nations has had a ministry now for over a decade in South Sudan. Why is this ministry of reconcile that's faith-based, that's connected to, to belief in God's love and grace through Jesus Christ, why is that so much needed? And Chelvis and Nancy shared, well, one of the things is that the UN ministry, it helps refugees from Su the country of Sudan, but from those in South Sudan who have had to flee their homes, there isn't a lot of help there for them. For many, they've seen other camps that are really just barren wilderness with some people, but not much resources. They've seen women giving birth without doctors or nurses or any medicine present. They've seen uh, families live without shelter overhead. They've seen children find water in pools of water on the ground, things that no human being made in God's image should have to go through. They also shared, though, that the UN's ministry is very needed and very helpful, but Nancy put it in a really great way. She said that the UN's ministry is like the leaves and the branches and the fruit of a tree. 
It's what you see. It's on the outside. It's there to really help, especially in times of crises. And it gets to the things that are the, the results that we see. Maybe it brings about food and medicine and shelter, things that are immediate needs, but it doesn't get to the root causes. It doesn't bring about real change. And what they shared was that the work of Reconcile and the work that they're doing in South Sudan is there to get to the roots of things. The decades and the centuries of hatred and division and violence based upon tribal differences and backgrounds and grudges and trauma and hurt. It's there to be a place that listens to people, that accompanies people who have been hurt and pain, that encourages the gifts of peacemakers, not from the United States or Western Europe or other parts of the world, but peacemakers who are from South Sudan in that place, who know their community and can build community. It's there to be a place to do the slow, hard work of true peacemaking and community building for a future. At the end of their conversation, they, they got a, a tougher question. The final question they got was, you shared a lot of what's going on with South Sudan, of the struggles there, but this has been a long time. And one person asks, do you see any hope for South Sudan? We're just kind of bandaging the same wound that's keep going to come again and again and again. Is there really any hope? Nancy replied first. And she said, I see hope. I see hope through the parents I meet. I see hope when a mother says, I did not get the opportunity to go to school, but I'm going to make sure my child gets to go to school. I see hope when South Sudanese church members fast one meal each and every day so that they can give the money they would have spent on that meal to refugees and people who are displaced from their home so that they can have food and medicine and shelter. And Shelvis added, the people of South Sudan, the people who I get to serve alongside, the people who have seen so very much, they have not given up. They've not given up on the possibility of peace for their children and their children's children. They know the seeds of peace they plant today will provide sweet fruit for those who follow them tomorrow. Throughout their site and the, the different stories they share, one of my favorites happened a couple years ago, a story of a pastor they've gotten to know well in South Sudan named Pastor Pasca Nimariano, and I probably am butchering that name, and I apologize to Pastor Pasca, even if you're not watching this, I apologize. But Pastor Pasca is one of the few female pastors serving in South Sudan. For the people of South Sudan, most females don't graduate just from primary school, let alone secondary school or college or graduate school or theological institutions. And so her journey is pretty amazing. Pasca grew up and her childhood at another time of horrific civil war and violence throughout Sudan and South Sudan. But she had parents who believed in her, who believed in peace, who believed that women and all people were called to use their gifts for a better world, no matter where they were come from or what others might think of them. And Pastor Pasca told them one day as they were visiting her church, she said, I was born in war. I grew up in war, I studied in war, I married in war, I'm still bringing children up in war. But there's a good thing I got to. The good thing that I got is because God has fulfilled my need. By being a pastor, there is help in my family. Even in my community, the community of my father, the community where I'm married. She said, when we come together as Christians, we find that we are truly the same. She shared that the word of God brings people together, brings hope and peace and love as nothing else does. And even someone who's seen such horror and terror and probably has a right to, to want vengeance and hatred against others, she says, we are the same. In a Christian way, you find that your level is the same. Because the word of God and the love of God is for everybody. 
Jelvis and Nancy share that whenever they visit Pastor Pascas Church, it's a place of great joy where, for all people. When they come through and wor- start worship, they're welcomed by big, great smiles and hugs and celebration. It's filled with great singing from children and youth choirs, and it's a place where rich and poor worship together. They say when they go there, it's a dream place that signals God's kingdom of peace. I believe that's what the path of peace looks like. It's not often through immediate, quick fixes. What happens quickly is violence and destruction. We see that throughout the news and the world, that violence and pain and hurt can happen so quickly. But peace and healing and a better future takes time. It takes hard work. It takes commitment. It takes doing everyday things of listening and walking with people and loving people and prayer and education and saying, let's come together. It's not easy. It's not fast. But that is what Shelvis and Nancy are doing. That's what Pastor Pasca is doing. And that's what Reconcile Ministry in South Sudan is doing. Anywhere I've been where I've seen real change and real peace move throughout a land has taken on this model. When I was in Northern Ireland for that year, I saw it through the community of Corimila in the North Coast that brought together Protestant and Catholic youth each and every day for decades. It didn't happen overnight. It took decades after decades for them to see we're not that different. We do have a lot similar, and we can come back to our communities and be neighbors and truly care for one another. I've seen it as well going last year to Guatemala and seeing the work of Sedepka, which doesn't do a lot of the big fruit and leaves and branches we might like to always see. Instead, it goes to the root causes and teaches people about the love and reconciliation and peace of Christ. It welcomes those who have no other home. It brings trauma healing to people. And I've seen a change in the communities in Guatemala because they've welcomed pastors and church leaders and dreamers across and said, we believe in this. Will you join us? The work of peace, the path of peace, is hard work. But this is the way God continues to speak and move and guide us for real change and real peace and real glimpses of God's kingdom here on earth. Let us hear again these beautiful and powerful words of Zechariah, reminding us that God is not done, that God is calling us to this work as well. Because of our God's deep compassion, the dawn from on heaven will break upon us to give light to those who are sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us on the path of peace. Amen.
Today we are invited not just to give our our regular offering as an action of thanksgiving and praise to God's love and God's ongoing work, but to to join with a ministry that is doing transformational healing and care and love in a really incredibly difficult and challenging time to reconcile ministry serving in South Sudan. Friends, I encourage you and invite you to join us in that work and supporting them this day. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for waking us up this day, for surrounding us in community, for allowing us to hear your word and good news, for reminding us that we are not alone in this work of ministry and love and reconciliation and hope for all your children. We pray, O loving God, that you receive this offering that you guide it and use it and help us steward it for the work of your kingdom, to bring love and life, hope and good news, healing and justice and peace to all your beloved world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for the beauty of this day, for the world you have made, for calling it good and calling us good. We thank you that when we make mistakes, you forgive us. And when there's violence and destruction in this world, you are at work for healing and hope and new life. We pray this day, O Lord, for the people of South Sudan and Sudan, for those who have had to flee their homes, for those who are just trying to make it each day, for those who have heard your voice and your calling to join in the work of peacemaking. We pray, O Lord, that you welcome and walk with each and every one of them, that you support them this day, 
that you surround them with your love, and that you guide us in our support. Lord, we lift to you as well the people of Gaza and Israel and Lebanon and Iran, and we pray for peace right now. We pray that there is not additional violence and more war and not an an escalation. We pray as well, O Lord, for some path forward, for a ceasefire right now, for a return of loved ones, for a rebuilding of so much destruction and homes, for children and families to be able to go home, to be able to be safe where they are. Lord, we pray continually for the people of Ukraine and Russia. We pray as well for an end to the war there and and a way for peace, a way for healing. Lord, closer to home, we lift up to you this community here in Greater Richmond. And this week, we pray for all teachers and parents and children as we've gone back to school. We pray for energy for the second week ahead, which can be a challenging week. We pray as well for, for them to know support and love and community in this great work they are doing and for building up all of our young people so that they may know who they are truly made and created to be. Lord, we also lift up to you our church. We pray for those who are in need of healing and recovery this day. We continue to pray, O Lord, for John and Brenda and pray for for peace and healing for them as they're back home. And we pray that you guide us as a faith community and church and a, a place you call your body to be a place of welcome, of hospitality, of love, and of of justice and peace in our community and across our world. Lord, in all these things we come to you knowing that you hear us. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our our final hymn for today is We Are Marching in the Light of God is one full of energy and joy. Uh, The words we're going to use are on the back page of your bulletin. And to share in that energy and joy and hope, Pastor Rebecca and I are going to be handing out egg shakers and other instruments, and we invite you to take them and use them as we sing. Yeah. 
Thank you all so much for making that beautiful noise, or beautiful sound to add to our song at the end. Uh, it was not noise, it was definitely music. Uh, and uh, if you were, as you go out, if you have shakers or if you have a basket that I think I lost somewhere over there, if you could bring them out and we'll collect them all uh, as we like to use them each Sunday at Worship in the Woods. But as you go out this day, uh, I first want to thank Janet Watts for being back with us. What a joy and privileges having her for a couple weeks. Uh, but as you go out this day, may you know that the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you this day and each and every day. Go with peace. Go with joy. Amen. <laughs>